Welcome. So great. It's, it's wonderful to see so many of you here today um, for a slightly different webinar that we'll be running. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Azim. I'm one of the co-founders of Bite Medicine. It's great to see a bunch of you here and welcome to anyone who's new. Thank you for joining us. Um, and I'm sure that you'll find today's webinar very useful um, where both Tash and Zach, who I will introduce shortly, will be covering um, the management of exam stress, some personal experiences and just mindfulness. We think particularly during this time, what's going on around the world, you know, mental health is such an important topic for everyone. So uh, I'm sure that you'll gain a lot from these guys and, and I'm sure I will as well. Um, so yeah, thank you for joining us. Um, just a few housekeeping announcements before I introduce both Zach and Tash. Um, I'm sure you guys know this already, but we offer certificates for attendance at all of our webinars. So please fill out the feedback form at the end um, and we will process these hopefully by the end of the week and get these certificates to you as soon as possible. Please do tell your friends, family about us. It's the only way we can continue doing what we're doing. Um, and thank you for all of your support. And please join us on Facebook, Bite Medicine for Students. That's where all our community is and that is where all our free webinar links, etc., are released. Without further ado, I would like to extravagantly introduce both Zach and Tash to you, who will be running today's webinar uh, on managing exam stress and mindfulness. So I'll start off with Zach. Some of you guys may have heard of his name. Some of you may have seen him posting sporadically all over Facebook, maybe bashing on his keyboard in the chat, but you've probably heard of his name. Um, so Zach is one of the co-founders of Bite Medicine, a good friend of mine and Schwabe's. Um, he's a final year med student at King's now, and he's, he's a fantastic guy. He's got so many distinctions that I get bored of hearing about them. Um, and I guess you're blessed now to see him in the flesh. Some call him an international man of mystery. Some call him the ghost, bearded assassin, whatever you'd like to call him. Um, really, some cry when they see him, some tremble in fear. But I guess we all agree that deep down, he's a big, cuddly bear. Um, and both for Schwab and I, it's an absolute honor to see him running his first webinar. Um, he loves managing both Schwab and I. Sometimes I have nightmares that he's standing at the end of my bed with a clipboard. Um, but deep down, we all love him and Bite Medicine would not exist without him. So thank you, Zach, um, for having your first webinar today. Thank and of you, course, man. Tash, um, absolute pleasure and honor for you to be here today. Tash is a third year med student at King's. Um, we stumbled across her on Instagram, she's a mental health advocate doing some amazing things um, on Instagram and on her social media. So please follow her at Tash underscore the medic. Um, yeah, and as I said, it's an honor to have you here, Tash, and thank you for joining us. So that's enough from me. I'm going to disappear until later on, um, and I'll leave you in the capable hands of Zach and Tash. Yeah, thank you very much, Azim. Um, I'm blushing. <laughs> Um, I'd like to firstly apologize to Tash because it should say um, Tash down here as well. Um, so Tash, I apologize. I think this topic is incredibly important, um, especially when medical students are so fixated on exam results. And I think there's much more about being a medical student than just than your uh, exam results in itself. I'd like to just ask, can everyone hear me? Can everyone see my screen properly? Yes. So basically, I have two monitors here, so I'm getting a little bit confused as to which uh, which monitor I look at. So I apologise if I'm looking back and forth. Okay. So I'll begin. So I've put exam stress in the corner here for a particular reason, um, and I'd like to talk about my own experiences beforehand. And then I think it's quite important that I talk about anxiety partially because it's quite critical for me to be open and honest um, before I try and divulge into exactly what exam stress is partially what that reflects. So I was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis almost about five years ago. Um, I won't go into the details, um, but it stripped and took away so much from my life. Um, whether that was how I interacted with my friends, with my family, um, and most importantly, how I approach stress and, and how I approach my exams. And I remember there was a particular period when I'd go from Wembley Park um, on all the way to uh, Finchley Road, so on the train. Um, and it's a stressful period. So you, you guys might be aware as to what ulcerative colitis would entail. Um, you get increased urgency, you get pain. But what was quite substantial to me was the urgency. 
So you're enclosed in this space. Um, and all you can think about is needing to go to the toilet almost urgently. Um, and there are times where you can cope. And that, that, that effect on you is substantial. And you think it, it would be just restricted to, to your experiences with the illness. But in reality, it caused so much anxiety about everything else, including my exams and how I saw exams. I had such low self-esteem when it even came to it. So I, I, I'm saying this because I think I've been on both sides of the spectrum. Before my diagnosis, I was an incredibly calm individual where I was never um, stressed about exams. To the point afterwards where all I could think about was this heightened experience regarding exams. All I could think about is what I had to do the next day, the next week, in a month's time, and I never could live in the present. So that's why I'm talking about this, because it's quite an important thing to try and decipher. Um, and I've kind of put exam stress in the corner here, uh, because it kind of reflects anxiety at the same time. So it's, it's there, but it's almost not there. So it's nagging at you in the corner of your mind, but it almost encompasses everything that you do in your life. So you worried about exams will determine when you go out, how you go out, um, would prevent you from enjoying your life to a certain extent. So it kind of determines all the choices that you have to make. And this brings me to um, our number one enemy um, as students and you know, future doctors. When you have an important task to at hand, um, we obviously procrastinate. Um, before I try and decipher what procrastination is, um, I want us all to try for five, 10 seconds, understand what procrastination means to you and how that looks like. So you can feel free to write in the chat what procrastination looks like to you. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, that's... Uh... Yeah. Oh, absolutely. YouTube is one of those things that you know, you, you, you open up one video and you're three hours deep in and it's a, it's a strange experience how you ended up watching cats and dogs and food. Yeah, brilliant, okay. Do you, what are the reasons as to why you'd procrastinate? So most people would say it's an issue of laziness. You're prevented from doing the work because you simply can't be bothered. And I think the majority of us all would say that laziness is the number one reason as to why we procrastinate. Others may say it's boredom, the task at hand, the more important task that we need to do, it just simply isn't interesting enough. Or it could be a fear, an incompetence. We are fearful of our lack of ability to carry out a particular task that we don't simply commit to it. And actually, the third point is probably the most reflective reason as to why we procrastinate. So I'll give you a lovely story about procrastination. So you've come back from clinic and it's 5 p.m. But you have an assignment due in about a week's time, whether it's a special module or any other medical school or physician associate um, modules that you need to do, essays. It's 6.30 p.m. because you're hungry and you've eaten. But it's 6.30, but you want to eat, um, you have a food coma, but you want to relax and, and you want to take a 30 minute nap. It's 7 p.m. now, you feel a little bit more refreshed. So you think you're, you're about ready to start working, but you open up YouTube and then before you know it, it's 9 p.m. So right in your head now, it's, you, you feel completely refreshed socially, entertainment wise, food. And now you're wondering when do you begin work? So you sit behind the computer, the laptop, and you open up the Word document and you pretend to start working. But you check that one email before you even start. And then things start flashing back to you. You start realizing, you know, you don't even have enough time or energy to begin working. And it's only 9 p.m. So you set an alarm for 6 a.m. You get into bed at 10 a.m., 10 p.m. Um, but you're overthinking, you're consistently thinking. So it's about 1 a.m. before you even fall asleep, but yet you set the alarm for 6 a.m. You struggle at 6 a.m. because the alarm is going off. You try and put the snooze button on, and now it's 6.30 a.m. 
but then your clinic starts at 8 a.m. So what's happened in the last couple of hours is that, including the, the, the hours of sleeping, which includes about 15 hours, you've struggled with yourself. You don't feel refreshed when you try to go to sleep early. You haven't achieved any work. And when it comes to work, you've wasted almost around seven hours of that day. And that's fine. Procrastination needs to be normalized. But at the same time, we need to be quite objective as to what it actually entails. So I'm going to use a, 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 a definition or a quote regarding to what procrastination is. And this comes from the word akrasia, which is Greek from Socrates and Plato, in which it would suggest that it's a state of acting against your better judgment. So this almost turns procrastination into this more deeper issue that's going on. So it's no longer a superficial, I am lazy, therefore I'm not doing the immediate task at hand, but one where judgment in which you synthesize the evidence around you and the circumstances around you to make the better call. So for instance, if I was to all offer you 10 pounds now or in a week's time, almost a hundred pounds, which choice would you make? I think the majority would say 100 pounds in a week's time. So is this a reflection of laziness or is this a reflection of judgment? So procrastination or exam stress, it's partially about the Amgadala hijack. So the Amgadala is essentially the, the threat perceiver. So when it recognizes that there's an immediate threat to you, you try and alleviate the distress. So this threat, in most circumstances, when we talk about a task, is one that makes us feel anxious or one that makes us feel that as though we have low self-esteem and therefore the priority for your body is to essentially remove that threat and therefore we understand procrastination as two different things one that's cognitive and one that's behavioral so behavioral is a physical manifestation of the procrastination whereas there is a cognitive effect that's taking place underneath and therefore, in most procrastinators' minds, we have this very simple equation where we almost reduce the grade in, in the exam to your, to your identity, to your worth. So, for example, it's going to be your performance, your grade, it's going to reflect your capabilities as an individual. Therefore, it's going to reflect your own value as a person. Now, how does this lead to procrastination? Well, if you do not think that you can achieve a particular performance or grade in an exam, you are less likely to commit to it because you are worried as to how that would make you feel. Your self-esteem would go down naturally because your performance reflects that and therefore how you view yourself as an individual. And the cognitive manifestation of that is that we potentially are not capable of controlling our negative emotions when it comes to procrastination. So what does this mean? So procrastination almost becomes a chronic habit. So the moment you set aside an immediate task, you feel an immediate sense of relief. So you're almost enforcing a positive reinforcement on that procrastination. And over time that becomes a chronic habit. And this all comes together to reflect maybe a deeper issue that we need to introspectively realize before we try and organize more time management apps and, and to look for other solutions. So ultimately, the, the next steps to understanding, understanding and, and addressing the exam stress is associated with looking inside rather than trying to organize your calendar more appropriately or trying to look for other task management tools. And I think I'll, I'll leave this up to um, Tash, who, who will brilliantly give us the guidance and, and, and the tools necessary to address the exam stress. Um, Tash, good to go? Yeah. Um, okay, so I first wanted to start by just you guys taking a moment to think, how do you actually handle anxiety on the whole and specifically how do you ma manage exam stress um, and if you could put some answers in the chat it would be really good to see what you guys do I don't know if I can actually see those answers myself but um, I'm sure you've all had a moment to consider those um, 
so I wanted you all to um, also think how you're feeling right now. So maybe you have exams upcoming, maybe you don't, maybe you're just sort of trying to prepare for the next time we have exams because as medical students and medical professions, you know, it's not something, exams are never going to go away. I'm sure you guys are all aware of that. So if we sort of start putting into practice ways during medical school, then hopefully as we proceed throughout our medical profession, we can manage that pressure and stress a lot better. So this is the basics of CBT basically, which is cognitive behavioral therapy. So it's really interesting when we start to take a situation. So let's say we're stressed about our exams and then we think about the thoughts that come into our head by this situation. So is it thoughts, you know, negative thoughts like I'm not clever enough. I've got way too much to learn. I'm going to fail this exam. And then that connects to our behavior. So, you know, maybe we start taking that stress and that those thoughts out on our family. So we start shouting at them or, you know, linking back to what Zach was saying, we start procrastinating. And then how does that link to our emotions? Do we feel sad and angry and frustrated? And then also how does that affect us physically? Um, you know, are we feeling tired? You know, do we feel our heart rate going up? So yeah, it's really interesting once you actually start taking that situation and then it's very easy to sort of be confused as to why you're acting in that way, but actually it all links and, and sort of makes sense. Yeah, so I'm going to propose a worry tree um, and I will go through this worry tree as my presentation proceeds. So we've got a worry and the first thing is to find out whether that's a practical worry or a hypothetical worry. And I'm, I'm going sorry to interrupt you. Um, I don't think you're screen sharing at the moment. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, okay, can you all see my screen now? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, my first two slides were just, so this one was explaining the basics of CBT. So you've got the stress, and then you've got the thoughts that I was speaking about, the behavior, your emotions, and your physical feelings. Okay. So yeah, this is my worry tree that I'm going to go through in this presentation. So you've got the worry, and then the first step is to work out whether that's a practical worry or a hypothetical worry, and I'm going to be explaining what those two terms mean in my next slide. And then depending on what kind of worry um, um, means what solution you're going to take. Okay, so what is the difference between a practical or a hypothetical worry? So let's start with a hypothetical worry. So these are probably more severe worries that, you know, they're the, like, what if this happens? And it's very much in the future. What if I don't pass all my medical exams? What if I don't make a good doctor? And they can feel very overwhelming because you feel like you can't do anything directly to control them. Whereas the practical worries genuinely, generally have, have more of a solution. So they might be, I'm really worried about learning all this topic content, but you can put in solutions to fix that hopefully. Okay. So my step two is to sort of try and take a worry and really break it down into each sort of trigger and each worry. So if you sort of say, I'm stressed about my exams, that can feel extremely overwhelming. But if you sort of break it down into, I'm worried about X topic um, and why you're feeling that way. Is it because you've just had a coffee? Is it because you've just spoken to your friend who you think knows everything and you don't know anything? Um, and then also, ask yourself how intense do I feel this worry is? You know, if, if it's something like I'm worried that I'm not going to make a good doctor, that might be near 90%. If, if it's something like I'm worried I might not remember this specific fact, it might be 10%. And then to um, write it down, write down whether it's a practical or hypothetical worry. Okay, so this is step three for the hypothetical worries. Um, and I sort of call this the like thought trial. So putting your thoughts on trial as if you were the judge. So yeah, so everything that I'm going through is something that I have put into practice myself and something that I'm still working on. Um, so I would tend to write the, this step down. So I'd write down, what is it that I'm worried about? what's the specific thing, which you can take from the previous step. 
And again, how intense is the stress or how likely do I think this worry is going to come true? And at the start, this might be about 75%. So then I'm going to go, well, actually, what is the evidence that this will come true? So <laughs> normally this list you'll find is quite short, whereas what is the evidence against this thought is normally a lot longer. And it is amazing how, you know, as humans, we sort of latch on to those negative thoughts. And, you know, if we just try and rationalize a bit and write it down, you know, as sort of scientific thinkers we can actually see oh hang on a minute i've got two reasons for the thought and 10 reasons against this thought and then just by doing that we can come ask ourselves again how stressed or worried are we now and hopefully i mean for me it always falls at least by sort of 25 percent and then finally to tell yourself what is the most likely outcome of this okay so this is more for our hypothetical worries that we can't put uh, immediate solution. Okay, so this is for our practical worries. So this is what I call solution planning. Um, so we're going to take that um, trigger and worry. We're going to take this and we're going to find as many possible solutions as we can and we're going to write all those down. So, you know, it's important this step not to rule out any solutions. And then we're going to sort of ask ourselves these questions that you can see. How likely do you think is, is it that the solution will help the worry go away? Um, can we actually perform this solution? Could the solution possibly make it worse? Um, and then we're going to choose the best one and we're going to write a really detailed action plan that includes when, who, where, how. As obviously when we're in like the depths of those anxious thoughts and those negative thoughts, it can feel sort of overwhelming to make that change but by putting really detailed steps into it sort of so say if it's around the topic of exams um if we're if we're revising about we're worried about one topic let's say it's cardiology so we're going to say when are we going to do it when are we going to revise that specific topic with who are we going to revise it with a friend or if actually that stresses you out more are we just going to do it by ourselves where are we going to do it are we going to sit at our desk or are we going to sit on the sofa to if that makes you feel calmer and how are we how are we going to do that what method are we going to choose to revise and hopefully by sitting down and planning when you go to do it there'll be less of the procrastination so of course this will probably seem very obvious to you but I think it's important to say it still that talking to someone can have benefits for all kinds of worries and stresses. Um, and even if it's talking through with someone what solutions you can put into place, you might find that they've had the same stresses and actually found this helped with it. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't ever sort of undermine how useful talking to someone actually can be. Okay, so this is my step for when you just can't control those worries. And ultimately, you know, all the steps that I've said so far are kind of in an ideal world. And it's important to say that, you know, by doing all, all these things initially, it probably won't help 100%, but hopefully it will help, you know, 10%. And as you teach your brain to, to do these tasks, hopefully we will sort of reteach our brain to think, think this way. Um, yeah, so this is sort of our worry time. And yeah, these are for the worries that just won't go away. Um, and so what I propose is that you take, you assign 20 minutes of your day, probably towards the end of the day, but not too close to when you're going to go to sleep. So say I choose six o'clock and I'm going to tell myself that that's when I'm going to think about those worries, which may sound a bit strange. Um, and, you know, it's important to stick to that time every day. So again, we're sort of creating a bit of a routine and our brain gets used to it. Um, but obviously at the start, it's going to be pretty impossible to just tell our brain to shut up and to stop thinking about those worries. Um, so what can we do if, you know, this happens? And actually, before I move on to that, let's just go over what sort of things we should be asking ourselves during this specific worry time. So is it still an active worry? So were we worrying about it at 11 a.m. in the morning and actually now it's fine at six o'clock? Um, and if it's not a worry anymore, um, 
you know, how did that go away? How did, how, how did you solve that? Or if it is, if it was something that you were worried about and it did come true, how did you cope with it? Um, and, you know, if it has gone away, would continue to worry about it, have changed anything? Um, and what could you be doing now instead of worrying? So, you know, there's lots of questions to ask yourselves and maybe during this worry time, you know, don't just sit there in your bed, just sort of start writing things down more. Um, yeah, but hopefully just by teaching ourselves that this is our specific time for worrying, we can continue with our day without procrastinating. But yeah, this is the ultimate goal. Okay, so yeah, what happens, that's all very well, Tash, but you know, I do it too. I tell myself I'm going to worry later about it, but you know, I still find that my mind wanders off. So yeah, we can write them down to address later. It's surprising how much that can help. And then sort of reconnecting with our senses, which sounds a bit strange. Um, but yeah, just really sort of thinking about our body, which means makes me sound like some kind of hippie. But um, yeah, it's amazing actually what that can do and just sort of grounding ourselves in that. Um, and then, of course, mindfulness, which I'm sure you've all heard of, is extremely effective. And I think the thing with mindfulness is we all kind of give it a go and then we're like, ah, oh, I'm no good at that. My mind's going off. It's a waste of time. But it's like all these things which I'm talking about. It takes practice. And as medics, I don't think we're very good at practicing things. We like to be good straight away. But it's amazing, actually, even five minutes of your day. So I started doing it like in the library after lunch. I'd come back and just literally five minutes. So if you are if you have a Spotify account, a student Spotify account, you can get Headspace, the app absolutely free. And even if you don't like there are so many different um, sessions on YouTube. Um, and, you know, this can just really sort of try and, you know, do the reconnecting with our senses, but in a more sort of um, focused way. Okay. And then, of course, I'm not going to bore you with all of these as I'm, I'm sure they're very self-explanatory, but that doesn't mean to, that doesn't take away how important they actually are. And I just want to really draw on the, the last circle, the avoid comparison. And this is something that is so easy to do as medical students and obviously we are we're compared to our colleagues you know we're, we're ranked you know according to to each other but it's so important to not um compare yourselves in terms of you know um my friend david is revising 12 hours a day i'm not doing anywhere near that oh now i can't go to the gym i can't exercise because I'm not doing enough revision otherwise, but it's really important that we remind ourselves that everyone has a different approach to revising and to exams. Yeah, and to sleep. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is a bit of a sort of personal one because I don't want to really give you a list of things that can help you sort of more distraction techniques. But it's really important to take the time and maybe take the time over summer during lockdown without exams to consider what really helps you, what makes you calm, what do you enjoy? And, and you know, it may be YouTube or it may be something really simple like having a cup of tea, having a shower, um, reading a non-medical book. That's really important that it's non-medical. <laughs> um, peaceful piano playlist on Spotify is excellent. I can recommend highly. But yeah, just take some time to find while you have the time what helps you. Um, and finally, I've just put a few resources down. Um, Therapist Aid is really good. It has lots of free downloadable sheets um, that sort of take you through what I've said in a more sort of structured way. So, you know, you can, if you know, when I was saying just write things down, you might say, what should I write down? That has some great um, worksheets that sort of tell you what to think about and what to write down. Um, Anxiety UK also have lots of resources. Some are free, some are like two pounds. Um, and remember if, you know, obviously we're talking about something that potentially can manifest into an illness. So remember that most universities will have a free counselling service and also your GP can refer you on to online services for CBT. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much all I have. 
Um, thank you so much for listening to me and thank you so much to the guys at Bite Medicine for inviting me. Um, I think it's so good that they've actually made this, made this webinar as I feel really passionately about the fact that you know things like this should be taught in medical school because ultimately if you don't have a diagnosis of anxiety and depression it doesn't matter we all feel moments of anxiety in our lives and it's so good to learn these like foundation blocks from the start but yeah Ooh, that's Thank all from me thank you very much Tash would you like to do a quick Q&A with the chat the people Ooh, in the chat is there oh, any questions for Tash or me or around the subject Also, in the meantime, please uh, fill out this form. Give me a second, let me screen share. Oh my word, that's mad. Joshua Evans, yeah. I met him in 2015. <laughs> it's a small world. How to manage lack of motivation, like it's been going. Lack of motivation. Um, so I think like all these things, I try and break them down into sort of manageable things to think about. So, you know, if you sort of just think about, oh, I'm unmotivated to do medicine. Well, actually, is it about that? Are you not enjoying the way that you're learning? Do you need to sort of mix things up? Do you need to start talking to your friends more? Um, what else is motivation? I think just really remind yourselves of, of why you went into medicine. Um, and take some time and, and don't force yourself to revise like if you're having a day where you're like oh i can't do this then it's so important to just take that day off and it'll be amazing how much more focused you are once you come back to it well that's what i find anyway i think that question Gigi, would be more relevant for shreve or azim shreve or azim do you want to jump in yeah, yeah. What was the question? So, yeah. thank you so much, Tash and Zach, as well. By the way, that was that was really really useful, brilliant. Um, is working uh, one more stressful than medical school? Having to work and go home and study. It's a very different type of stress, uh, in my opinion. I think what what Zach and Tash have been talking about is super important. I think the stress of medical school is often obviously exam exam related and comparing yourself to other people, and that stress can take you anywhere you go. You wake up and you can be stressed about it. You can fall asleep and, and can really take over your life. The stress I found of F1 and F2 um, is different in that the actual job, when you're on the job and there is that you're in a stressful environment, whether that's because of colleagues or because of unwell patients or unfamiliar surroundings, that can be acutely very stressful. Now, the slight difference between medical school and that is that when you're at medical school, whether you're on placement and come home, you can then come home and keep revising. You can always have that thought of revision and you know medicine in your head. With F1, F2, you can be in acutely stressful situations. You can you know, be having a tough time with your colleagues, et cetera. But when you come home, the goal is to try and switch off. If you can have good ways to do that, like some, a few ways have been discussed, whether that's creativity, art, music, et cetera, that's really what, what you need to try and get into the routine of that medical school the best you can. Because in F1, F2, you are going to see things which are going to be exceptionally traumatic, things that will make you cry, things that will be upsetting. Not to, that, that is the reality, not to stress you out. Um, but that's really one thing I recommend is, is trying to find those outlets to try and relieve some of that stress because uh, the stress is very different is what I, what I found. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hopefully that goes some way to answering that question. Yeah, I think it's so good to sort of put these like building blocks in place now while we have the time, you know, even if you don't specifically suffer from being anxious or, or worrying, like, you know, like Azim's just said, ultimately, being a doctor is a stressful job. So if we can find the things that help us cope with it now, then that can only be a positive thing. No, thanks, Azim. Yeah, that was insightful. Yeah, I think no a really good question, actually. Um, is how do you keep yourself less stressed with competitive friends or to avoid the peer pressure associated with studying? You know, hearing someone they're studying 12 hours a day, mm -hmm. that can be quite grinding on you and your confidence. So how do you go about managing that? Yeah, it's something that, you know, I myself this year actually 
found myself doing sort of comparing myself to my flatmates um, and it's so important to find out what works for you so some people might need to go for a short walk before they have a focused studying session and some people might they might not need to do that and it's also important to remind yourself that it sounds very silly but the person that sits in the library for 12 hours it, you know it's quality over quantity um, it doesn't mean that everything that they're doing is going into their head so I think you know it's quite easy during exams to forget all the sort of self-care things and you're like oh, I'll do that after exams like it, it's not important and I'm I'm guilty of that as well a little bit but something that I'm working on um, but yeah just I think you know you've got into medical school so you know kind of touching on the imposter syndrome question like you are good enough and you will pass the exams um you you know when you sort of weigh up the evidence for doing well and the evidence against doing well you'll find that the evidence for doing well is, is a lot you know a lot more um i don't know what else to suggest to stop comparing yourself i think it just takes practice to really ask yourself what what do i do that has made me successful to this point you know I've always passed exams, so let, let me do that. I don't know. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. Um, yeah, it's difficult when you've got people always mentioning how many hours they study, but you're absolutely right. It's, it's honestly quality over quantity. And we had a talk from Miguel, um, and people were asking him how many hours a day did he study to achieve the highest mark in his finals. And the only thing he had to say to that was he knew what he had to cover and he knew what he didn't know. So it's just overcoming that. He didn't associate any number of hours that he had to allocate per day to study. And I think having that kind of focus of revision becomes your entire day, I think that's where the problems start arising from. Because we see ourselves as, as our grades and we see ourselves as, as you know, performance that we, we achieve in the exams. And I think that that becomes more problematic over time, unfortunately. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's also important so this is something that I struggle with especially during like A levels it felt like life or death it felt like it was the most important thing in my life but actually if you take a step back you realize actually you know if the worst situation does happen it's not you know there are other ways around it so it's so easy to become fixated with just that exam but you have to remember that life will go on after the, that exam um, and you will, will you, I think the thing with sort of anxiety and worrying about things is you tell yourself you're not going to be able to cope if it is to happen. Um, so just by reminding yourself that, you know what, if it does happen, I will be able to cope because ultimately everyone on this Zoom chat now, things have gone wrong in your lives and you are still <laughs> doing extremely well. You're clearly a bunch of very successful people, so you can cope. Um, yeah, <laughs> that was quite passionate. <laughs> um, I think I've got a good question from T. Uh, not a question, but a reflection. Um, she took some extended, or he took some extended period away from medical school for mental health reasons. And I think making that kind of choice and decision is difficult, but it, it's, it's very good for, for your journey, I think. I mean, I did the same thing. I, I took almost two years out of medical school due to my ulcerative colitis. Um, and then my parents always forced me to, you know, carry on, uh, and do as much as I can, um, and push on. But then taking those years out taught me so much more than I could ever imagine. And sometimes it's important to just stay still and reflect as opposed to just forcing yourself to just carry on as much as you can. Yeah, it's, it's so hard, I think, to take that initial step. Mm. Um, and I think in some ways I was very much considering that in this last the last year, but this lockdown has sort of been a blessing in disguise on that front for me. So, yeah, I'd really emphasise the importance of sort of, I don't know how many of you still have exams now, but after those exams end, really using that time valuably to think how you can implement these methods, because ultimately it's unfortunately not something that you sort of start doing you do a bit of baking and woo, <laughs> you're all happy again um so yeah don't don't give up on these methods like find what works for you i think is the most important thing because you know there's, it's not one size fits all i guess 
Uh, should we take a couple more questions and then we'll call it a day, if that's okay with you, Tash? Um, oh, a good question from Faraz is, um, any advice on developing a thick skin or resilience or dealing with seniors? Mm, it's so difficult, isn't it? Because you don't want to grow too much of a thick skin that you sort of become a, you know, you lose all your emotions and your empathy. But equally, if you're affected by everything you see, then it's going to be emotionally draining. Um, I think resilience comes with being able to have these sort of coping mechanisms that when things go bad, when you've seen something that's upset you, you know, you're allowed to feel upset. <laughs> I sort of really dislike the fact that sort of doctors can't feel sad. Doctors can feel sad, but it's how we then go away and deal with that. So it doesn't affect the other patients that we see. You know, it doesn't mean that the next day or for the next week we're coming in every day feeling really sad that we don't focus on the other patients to give them the right care. But, you know, even if you have to sort of take a step out, I've spoken to GPs that, you know, just had to delay their next patient by 20 minutes because they needed that, that cup of tea to, to refocus themselves. So that meant, so that although the next patient came in 20 minutes late, they could give them the right quality of care. Um, I don't know if I've really answered the question, but I'd say like thick skin isn't necessary, but sort of being able to, to feel um, sad, you're allowed to feel sad and then how you yeah, cope with that. I'm rambling now. Yeah. Um, someone asked, how did you spend your two years, Zach? Um, I can't remember. <laughs> no, um, God. I think it was a difficult period because I still had my UC symptoms, um, my ulcerative colitis symptoms. So it wasn't a break, unfortunately. It was just more about reorientating myself um, because it, being diagnosed with something causes you to undergo almost an existential crisis. Um, and I think I was just trying to manage how I viewed myself, my own identity uh, in those two years. And I don't think I could have done that whilst also studying for exams at the same time. I don't think that would have been feasible. And I think it, I'm, I'm proud in the sense I had the, 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 the confidence to, to make the right choice then, even though I had such lower self-esteem due to my illness. Um, but yeah, thank you guys for sharing your, your personal stories, by the way, in the chat um, is a safe space. Um, answer two more questions. Um, Tashi, have you found one? You want to answer a particular one? Um, how do you deal with desensitize? I can't say that word. Desensitization in medicine. Uh -huh. um, um, yeah, I, it's something that worries me going into the medical profession because you know you start off be, being like, I want to do medicine because I'm super empathetic and I want to make a difference and save the world, and then you sort of could see consultants who are sort of just you know a hospital is their natural habitat they're kind of forgetting that most patients are lying in this hospital bed hating being in hospital and being worried sick um and yeah i i do think that sometimes doctors sort of do become desensitized to how horrific that time can be for patients and you know even if we're talking about mental health illnesses and although sort of those more difficult questions become normal to us to say them you know sort of if we're doing a suicide risk assessment we you know by the time a gp is five years into their career how many times have they asked those questions but for that patient although we don't want to be sort of uncomfortable saying them actually just taking a moment to sort of think this person is going through you know it's not normal to them i think that's what i'm trying to emphasize i don't really know if i've answered the question <laughs> but I, I think there is a balance with all of this you know obviously if we were to be so emotionally affected by everything we'd see we would probably burn out and 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 not be able to manage but i'd like to think that as a doctor i will never completely <laughs> lose that but i don't know maybe 10 years down the line i'll be a different person <laughs> but yeah that an interesting take would be from azim or Shweb. like they've they've been junior doctors for a while um, azim or Shweb, do you feel like you've become a little bit more desensitized to the patient experience mm, that's, that's a really good question i think tash's explanation there was was really interesting as well 
Um, I mean, unfortunately, the reality I'd say for myself is probably yes, um, which is which is very very sad. Like, obviously, as a junior doctor, F one, F two, you you go through various rotations. You see a lot of the same things, and you see a lot of very different things. Um, there are going to be times which are very traumatic and emotional for you, but on the whole, your day to day job is relatively mundane if you actually if you actually look at it because a lot of the jobs of an f1 and f2 are going to be those administrative type jobs writing edls discharge letters etc um and i think all of that can breed desensitization in terms of how to avoid it it's, it's difficult um i think when when it comes to it for me personally like i've had friends and family members who have been admitted to hospital and when you put yourself in their shoes, you can actually realize, like Tash said, that although you see these patients from your own perspective as an employee and um, you can see a lot of patients over a short period of time and you can often you know, see them all with the same you know, lens. In reality, when you have friends, family members who you really love and care about going through this process, you will see that deep down, even a brief admission to hospital has a really deep psychological impact on people. Whilst we get desensitized, people get institutionalized pretty quickly within hospitals. Um, and I think that's probably something that I subconsciously try and do more. So working in A&E particularly, you see a lot of presentations, a lot of people coming in with things which they didn't necessarily need to come in and you can get frustrated by. But often these people aren't coming to A&E because they're trying to cause trouble because they're genuinely concerned about their sore throat, which is probably nothing, or their headache, which is probably nothing. Um, and until you can really empathize with that, um, you know, that, that's a process, that's a learning process. The key is that to try and avoid desensitization, that there's no real one answer to that. But I think you need to remember, you know, F1, F2 is only two years. Until you're a consultant, it's another 10 odd years, eight to 10 years. So if you're getting desensitized in those first two years, the key is to ensure that that doesn't keep happening over the next eight years, because um, if you're completely desensitized by the time you're a consultant, it will, it will be a very sad journey for you and for me. Like it's, it's a process, but I, unfortunately there's no real one stop answer to that for, from my personal experience. I think it's just about talking to friends, family members about what you're going through. Um, and, you know, I think just having an open discussion with others, if you feel like you are becoming desensitized um, and also being honest with yourself as well. Um, but as I said, there's no, I wouldn't say there's one specific answer to that question, but it's a very good question. Yeah, it's interesting what you were saying about, you know, when a family member gets admitted to hospital. Like, I remember one doctor telling me to sort of always treat every patient as though they were your mum or dad, but ultimately that could be emotionally draining. <laughs> you know, imagine treating your mum 20 times a day and, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, absolutely. I think it's such a balance isn't it because you don't want to burn out and you know you need some resilience but then you don't mm. want this sort of brick wall that all these feelings bounce off yeah it's a, it's a, it's a difficult yeah. balance isn't it for sure mm. thank you azim uh thank you tash i think we'll round off here um a couple of points please visit tash's instagram she's got brilliant revision notes um and mental health topics where she discusses things um tash underscore the medic correct yes um also feel free to email me at zachbytemedicine.com regarding any um issues around mental health or um, anything else that we can support you with at bite medicine and finally please visit www.bytemedicine.com to check out our website any um textbooks we're increasing our content on a on a weekly monthly basis